Hi, everyone. Hello. My name is Ross Carr, and I'm the Artistic Director of the International Contemporary Ensemble. And I am here talking with Du Yun, who du Yun. introduced herself. Is here in the house and in the room. Hello, I'm Du Yun. I am the composer and a performer. Um, and I wrote the piece and performing in the production. Yes, upcoming this week. We have a production of two evenings, April 29th and April 30th, of uh, Du Yun's works, Cockroach's Tarantella, followed by Zola. In between, there's a world premiere of a film created by another collaborator who we'll talk about soon, um, as the general topic of this conversation is going to be about collaboration. Um, du Yun, we've been asked to tell the origin story of our work together but I kind of want to jump back in time further. What is your origin story of collaborating with, or in fact, founding the International Contemporary Ensemble? Yeah, um, <clears throat> so we were in college and not knowing what the world was. It was like, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, I, you know, I feel like we were, I was in, a, I was in Oberlin where I went to undergraduate wave um, and, and it was just in that incredible energy of so many people putting on concerts ad hoc, late night concerts that is in addition to the recitals and professors are not there. You know, you just kind of like get your friends together and improvisationally and, and do, do projects. Some of them are crazy projects. Um, and uh, and many of them actually, uh, we you know we be begin to really like each other and said we should uh, have this ensemble, and that was the original uh, idea of um, international contemporary ensemble. Yeah, and, and that I was Claire Chase, Josh Rubin, and Rebecca you. Heller, <laughs> me, David Shosko, um, Maya, so mm -hmm. many. Yeah. Wendy Richmond, Kivi Khan Lippmann. Kivi Richmond, yes. So the, the, the origin of the ensemble is, um, if you were to boil it down to the most basic thing, it's a bunch of college classmates who wanted to create new things together. They didn't just want to interpret work that already existed, although that was also a big part of the passion of their founding, which is that there are works out there that need um, a lot of investment, a lot of passion, a lot of time, creativity, renewal in some case for some of the some of the works. And the ensemble was founded in that desire, and that shared desire continues today. And so, and sort yeah. of like bypassing the need of wanting to have approval stamp. Right. So I think Absolutely. that is so important for us to remember now is that you know, I mean, even in the so-called professional worlds, young ensemble will still have to wait for three years before the critics gonna come in or like the grant come in. So in a way, when you are starting so young and this is also a way to say, okay, you know what? We're just gonna do it mm -hmm. before thinking, oh, oh my God, like how many uh, roadblocks and the gate things that we have to go hurdle at, right? It's, it's I think it, at the, in the end, you know, it was the projects that excite us. And we just thought, let's just put up projects and and concerts and putting on things so that was kind of like an in continuation of that spirit mm -hmm. of not wanting the professors to be in the room right so so that was the need of of of, of having this um ensemble with our friends yeah and creating that kind of autonomy where the group could focus on the work and the work being creative work to perform new pieces commission them create them together perform them that's the work those are the ingredients for yes. the you know the expression of this ensemble and, and artist driven right we don't absolutely. want it to like ensemble is often like you know the top down this hierarchy mm -hmm. and it was a very clear choice from the very beginning that um it, the the conductor will always be artist in residence not like conductor who mm -hmm. and then it's musicians you know it's mm -hmm. always also musicians will bring in uh, the ideas and mm -hmm. bring, uh, uh, I, you know, for, from repertoire to to who they wanted to play with and all that. Yeah, absolutely. If the if the artistic decisions are coming from from the ensemble itself, from the members, from the 
from the leaders who are often rotating into new positions and it creates the opportunity for autonomy because musicians can be good administrators, leaders, project managers in and of themselves. And that's kind of what keeps the ensemble sustained is that the musicians become uh, integral parts of not only the creative process and the execution of that, the performance on the stage, but also uh, fundraising and you know the nuts and bolts of how this stuff maintains and sustains itself. Um, and so that's been still a core part of our ensemble, even as it's matured and added a lot of new features and professionalized certain things that might feel more like um, chamber groups and orchestras with the staff and support, it still has at its core, the decisions of what gets played and why we play it is made by artists and musicians. Um, and most recently that's taken the form of bringing one of our longtime collaborators, George Lewis, whose music we focused on at NYU Skirball before the pandemic in as a leader of the ensemble. Um, and so George is now the new artistic director, but also folks like Du Yun and Marcos Balter and collaborators on the board of directors to make sure that the overall leadership follows an artistic vision more so than anything else. So that's, I think like the question of how the, how we first started this group, you first started this group, I wasn't around yet. Um, I was one of the people, yeah. Not, exactly. Yeah, um, I'm, but, but it, as you were saying, you know, I, I was, by the way, uh, I just wanted people to know that there's no need for me to kiss ass to Ross. Mm. I do want to take this moment to say that, you know, just to see you um, running around with the production and oversees so many things, it's also, and grow into what, you know, you were being an artist director for the ensemble for 10 years? Six years, or, yeah. Well, six years, I feel, oh, before that, it was, it feels like forever, mm -hmm. um, but that kind of multi, you know, uh, was multitasking, not just multitasking, but like really on top of each, everything, that kind of employable skills is so good to have. And, and we often talk about, you know, what artists should really have, not just doing one thing, right? But to run through the, all these events and through all these tasks and stand on top of each other. And I think this is, what the ensemble's model have encouraged our members to grow into those roles and to grow into this incredible um, powerhouse of skills in addition to a powerhouse uh, performers. It, it sort of leads to the next question that was suggested, which is like, what has, what has that experience taught us? What have we learned together in this work? And I'll just riff off what you were saying, Yoon, which is that what the most important thing that we've learned is that you can't or it's unlikely unusual especially in this kind of music to to take each decision in its own lane everything has to be thought of holistically and in codependent ways so if you're deciding about a micro detail of this kind of um, percussion equipment that's being rented or this kind of grant that you're applying for everything talks to each other and so it actually fostered a really important feature of this ensemble that people have more awareness for all of how this, this, um, this ensemble works creatively, administratively, and everything in between. And that does create, as you said, do you like a, a kind of um, need to wear a couple hats at a time sometimes, um, but also how to always think about the work, the creativity, and the ethics around uh, creating that kind and, of work. And logistically, right? So I think that as a composer, you know, um, I now teach. Uh, so my job as a as a mentor, I often say that I encourage the ambition, the wild mm -hmm. ambition, the wild imaginations. Um, but then there is the logistics, there is the reality. Mm -hmm. And that's often, it's a negotiation. It's never about killing the wild imagination. It's, it's mm -hmm. a negotiation of trying out the different paths of how make one thing could happen, right? So it's still, the 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 wild imagination keeps integrity yep. has that integrity but mm -hmm. then how can we have it and i think for me that was a very good lesson to learn because i was working with my friends for instance mm -hmm. in on the paper i was like oh i want to have like percussion do this 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 and then da, 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 da. and then when i see my friends actually have to 
do all those things and and prepare all those things i was like oh that is maybe it's a little bit too much you know yeah. like okay <laughs> i slow down and so people are not really you know uh, uh you know you know what i mean like you see sometimes it it, it, it is worth the sweat but sometimes it does not so right. my my role of a of a creator need to understand that to find differences and is this is also one of the things that i'm trying to you know bypass to 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 my students now too is is it's because sometimes i feel like we when you have nothing in front of your pages mm. and it's a crazy task um for you uh, as a producer when you have like we, what is the season going to look like mm -hmm. nothing right mm -hmm. so you mm -hmm. gradually come things there and then you have to we have to pare it down we have to pare it down mm -hmm. but without feeling like we are sacrificing mm -hmm. to our vision so mm -hmm. that is the fine line i really felt like i owe a lot to because i work with um the ensemble mm -hmm. Italy. that's great i like that um approach a lot i think i would describe it as a scaling you know it's not just it's not only scaling but also as you said different paths so every time a difficult decision is presented we create myriad um potential solutions and outcomes and always conversationally just as you said you're talking with that percussionist you've written a part that oh now it's it's not impossible but it requires a lot so you have empathy for their their position because you are a musician too and and in cultivating a collaborative empathy um, we know that we can't do everything. Mm -hmm. um, and in scaling back, there's a way to do that creatively and also with compassion. Mm -hmm. I, that's the thing in the next question that we've been sort of um, asked to consider is like what's challenging and surprising. To me, it is that balance of like empathy and compassion yeah. while also yeah. really having a high ambition for yeah. the work. And yeah. I wonder if you could speak a little bit about that, continue to, that thought a bit about totally. how um, to balance that. I think that you know when we were starting the ice uh, the ice lab, right? That was a, a sort of like because we were also tired of this having this one time off war war premiere thing, and then and that that's it, you know. See you never. Um, but I think the frustration for for creators is often put so much time and so much thing energy into creating a, a new work, and then it's this really limited time to rehearse and that's it. And no one giving a chance to understand what the idea might be and could be. So I think it's about giving a chance to try things out, not to exactly immediately say, say shut down, I, you know, things like this would happen if I try this and this would happen if I do this. And then, and then, of course, um, as a composer, creator from that role, you, we, I feel like I need to also be very aware of that when I see there is this attempt, and that is the gap of what could not happen, and I have to make a really fast decision to let it go. Um, but there are, at the same time, there are times that, you know, I know what I want and I know with a little bit pushing, a little bit of things, I will get what I want. So this is it's also an, a skill of art, right? Like, um, you know why and you, you stand firm of what you want and because you're also very realistic and know that could happen. If, am I making, yeah. I think that's, that's really true. Basically, it's the balance between um, a vision for uh, an outcome and the ability to describe that vision to your collaborators is like, it's true at the level of, do we start this ensemble at all? Does one start an ensemble or do we play this louder and faster than we thought possible? They're both the same kinds of decisions. They take a risk, but you don't take a risk without having a collective understanding of why. Yeah. And I think that collective understanding of why is how we create the kind of compassion of the, of the collective itself. Um, and so that's been the thing that to articulate that and really feel and understand that as a collaborative principle is the, is a thing that surprised me in joining this uh, ensemble. And I've learned a lot from working with, with Duyun and with a lot of collaborators that we've worked with through the Skirbel process, through David Lang and George Lewis and a lot and Jim Finlay, lots of risks are taken, but never blindly without bringing everyone into the why. And sometimes that has to happen fast. Like in the collaboration, you say, okay, I want you to do this and it's going to feel really 
odd or awkward, but here's why. And mm -hmm. that's, that's, I think, an important feature of, of what we've been doing. Yes. And week. I feel like, you know, like the, I, I'm definitely one of them that I feel I'm so lost at loss, at worst casing point now, I'm like, oh, the thing, ah. Oh. Um, and then there's the time like, I was like, oh, that's why I'm a composer, you know, I do it like music. Um, but I also think the, the syntax, I get lost in the syntax, but dramaturgically or why I know the why I wanted to do this. Mm -hmm. I can hear it, but I don't know how to put it in words yet. So Absolutely. from the performer's point of view and things, you know, I, I feel like I'm in a very good, trusted, supported, safe place where I, be, I can be like, oh, I don't know, but that's the thing what I want. Uh, oftentimes, you know, you, if you're in the, in the situation where you feel like you're being judged, when you don't know what you can articulate as yet, and uh, yeah, so so that is something that um, having ensemble, you know, for everyone going into and understanding, we are not expecting all the collaborators to be super eloquent as we go into the working relationship. Top of the day. Yeah, I I th I, th I think I agree with what you're saying and and understand that the. Um bringing every, every person into the same detail of a vision isn't necessarily what the goal is in a collaboration, but even at the be even if for a collaboration that spans many years, like the ensemble, like not every person's um, uh, brain has to be charged with the responsibility of understanding all the details, but always the question of why is known. Um, and so there's not any, uh, so we, it, so there's less doubt this builds up around, around what it is that we're doing, why we're assembling, uh, because the music that we're doing is not self-evident, never has been. It needs, it doesn't, it doesn't fall into a mass appeal or populism. So it needs a lot of uh, vision of description of why. And there's an interesting question that comes next, which is that do you and these works that we're playing are not brand new, but they have had performances in different versions. And that speaks to this question of, how has your work changed over time? So maybe reflect on the 2006 Zola and the new one, and what's changed for you about process and about the aesthetics of it? Of this piece per se or general? Let's start with this piece and then maybe generalize it. Yeah, uh, this piece, well, I first start because um, uh, one of our founding members, uh, a percussionist, um, uh, David Shosko, um, at that time was working at this uh, Soho Gallery, Fine Art Gallery, uh, Rosenberg and Fine Art. Um, so he, we decided that we are going to have a, a music event with the images, with the paintings in it, you know, with their art series. So, so we were given this like, well, not we were not, we were never given an opportunity, but we sort of like negotiated, we championed these ideas. And uh, and the and Stephen and the friend happily said, yes, you know, we're very excited about this idea. So the 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 the, the photographer, um, Frank Turi, they were uh, the one of the exhibitions, um, it's called a Zola, actually. Um, that was actually from his uh a uh, catalog and Zola and I really loved um his photographs because it's 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 the, all this analog and it's about um this like silences in between which is in the photography terms it's the blank spaces and the shadowy things and he is American uh, Italian I talk about a lot about the rules and things so I really like connected with that so I and I thought, oh, let's just do a kind of like a, a few songs uh, to tie it with the images. And then this is like before I want to do anything to do, have, I wanted to do anything with um, opera because I really do not like an opera. Um, so I thought, ah, I can do like a music theater. So. So that's how, and then, then, uh, then I was looking at some of the Pasolini's test, 
text because Italian, and he was, you know, think, and then there's like a deconstruction of that text. Um, and then I realized that I should just like, and then, okay. Woo! And then I realized, I don't know how to put them together. But then I realized I love to write stories. So I was like, aha, I'm going to write stories. So that to say, to serve as a structural point to connect these different songs together and different images together. And that was the original idea. That was the original version of, um, of Zola with a, a few songs. And then uh, we talked to Lydia Steyer, who is also one of our um, uh, uh, classmates really uh, from Oberlin and now is a very well-known um, stage director in Germany. And, and, she's, and we were also doing the uh, eighth songs uh, for Matt Kings uh, with Peter uh, Santis. And so there was a double bill of, uh, at PS122. And I believe actually, Ross, this was the first uh, staged production uh, International Contemporary Ensemble have ever did. Um, yeah, both these pieces are, are, it's a part of the origin story of the ensemble's foray into staged work. And it, artists of that age and experience just were guessing what they should do, you know, based on their <laughs> their undergrad educations. And, and, and it's still really impressive to look back at the photos and the footage of your piece, of Sola, of Eight Songs for Mad King by Peter Maxwell Davies with Lydia and Peter and the inventiveness and the like the, the boundaries that were pushed in presenting that really put the ensemble in a new footing, not only of, of collaboration, but design. And we didn't, we don't talk about, the ensemble doesn't often talk about two things that we do a lot. One is designed work, it doesn't necessarily call it stage work because sometimes it's more of an intermedia approach. Um, can I but share this, a secret now? Because I, I think it's a good absolutely. to, to share a secret. secret. Um, um, I wrote the singing just as I wrote the singing. I didn't think I would do it. I didn't think I, you know, um, I, I know that I wanted Peter Sandis to, to sing the tenor part uh, at the time. And then, um, and then I think it was because it would be cheaper for me to do it. <laughs> singing wise I mean we're talking about Ross we are talking about also during the work like rehearsal week I remember we were sleeping on the floors on people's floors and on David Shosko's floors <laughs> we were like David well and so so that's how like actually that was the really really birth years of of the of the ensemble that also trying to move to another city and do this production and not and also you know as you were saying when there is a stage production it, it needs more rehearsals and needs all, all these other things um so it was everything was new to us and and we go through this kind of uh, new rehearsal uh, stages and 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 then it was actually after Zola I realized that maybe I can sing <laughs> no 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 like because so, yeah this is I so crazy yeah because like I was like oh this, this I should do it and then I always wanted to have a band you know and then and I remember I don't know if you know uh, Lawson White. Um, mm -hmm, he was actually um, doing the sound. He recorded the first uh, recording of the 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 recorded thing. And I said, I was like Lawson, you know, I I, I really wanted to, like, maybe I should have a band. And he's like, yeah. I was like, well, I don't know, like, how to write the lyrics. He looked at me dead in the eyes. He said, Do you? You just wrote a whole of things. I was like, ah, oh, yes, yes, yes. But you know, sometimes. What I'm trying to, the merit of my wanting to share this secret is to say that sometimes you, that's the wild imagination, right? I, I was referring mm -hmm. earlier. You just do it, ah, and then you're like, okay, the reality, oh, how to put them together. And then afterwards, you, you might be so surprised of that product that were really open to another territory that you would never imagined it could even be possible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. After that piece, actually, um, I was like, oh, opera is not that scary. Oh, like opera. So that was, and then uh, and then the Zola went to um, the uh, city opera of Vox 
were uh, with George Steele and Ed Im, mm -hmm. and with Beth Morrison was also associate uh, producer, and where I met Royce Fabric, and that's how I began to write Angel's Phone. It's it's really a, it's an amazing story because it, two things happen that I'm noticing. One is that because you know we always have this phrase necessity is the mother of invention, but there's also like another turn of phrase that would indicate that necessity you needing to hear this sound and the only person kind of available to do it was you you discovered a new artistic pursuit or a new performance persona um and the other thing is that each of these projects and the nature of collaboration it feeds iteratively it's not just about the project you're working on now it's about new relationships you know the relationship between you and Eddie Kwan, who is performing in this piece, and the relationship between Russia and you and Russia and the ensemble. And so collaborations are about building a kind of, um, I don't want to use the buzzwords like network or ecosystem, but it's, it is truly a, 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 a big boat <laughs> that we all get to get in and more and more people get into the boat. And it's very satisfying part of not just New York City, but especially the New York City art scene. Um, but what and, was the first buzzword after? Um, I, I said network. Oh, network, network. That's buzzword number one, because the corporate world uses that. And buzzword number two is ecosystem, because I used ecosystem for the 500th time the other day, so I've decided I have to retire it. Can I add, um, add another buzzword, which is, diversity, so. which is diversity? Yeah. This is actually, to me, when people talk about diversity, I'm like, let's really look at the core, at the pupils of what diversity really means right diversity means so many things other than just the name the color the everything else it means also um the people the the why we are here for me at least you know um so that is why my need to wanting to work with eddie that was the my my my, my need wanting to bring this new my voice to say, you know what? I, my, this kind of voice can exist in the world of opera. You know what? If I don't like opera, you know what? I can maybe change it. I can make it into something that I, at least I like a little bit. I cannot say I like a lot, but as I was writing, I, I, I can do something that excites me, you know? Like that's why in Zola means it was so much like, like uh, uh, inspirations from Tom Waits, from Paolo Gante, who is this Italian singer, um, and, and, and all that, it, because that's the music and that's the sound that I enjoy listening to. Uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In addition to, 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 to Western European operas, sure. right? It's sure. never about uh, uh, what is not, what is, it's about coexistence. Yeah, and that's the that's the root of what you know. Uh, forget about the, the the buzzword of diversity, but that's what about like more sound, more reasons to coexistence, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yeah. and, and to 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 really thrive together. And this is what I've been really trying to champion of uh, voices. And I don't mean uh, you know I mean actually literally musical voice in the field that is has not seen right like say like satomi who uh, like from dear she she would say i don't read music but i've been championing people who don't read music and are working with oral tradition like it, it's not it's so to me uh we music is just a documentation of mm things and that there are other ways for us to learn music mm -hmm. so if we can you know build that up more of our approach to music mm -hmm. and invite more people to coexist mm -hmm. only you know to coexist and i think we can thrive a little better mm -hmm. yeah that's well said and and i wonder if that brings you maybe the last thing we'll talk about for five minutes or so is the zola when you wrote it and zola now and the world that that was the 2006 world mm -hmm. and the world that we live in 2022 mm -hmm. how how is the has the context changed how have the words garnered new meaning in the libretto yeah i was um i was uh, uh, doing an interview last week um i was expressing that how as an 
and as an artist who wrote it, you know, it was almost like 25, 20, 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago. Um, because last year, Ross, we went to record it for some of the ex experts for our opera. And the one of the resign uh, uh, chapters, I remember I was uh, narrating. By the way, the first edition of the productions, I was only the singing, I was not the narrating. So mm -hmm, in the mm -hmm. last year's uh, edition, I was narrating. Um, so that was my also my first time narrated. Uh, but as I was writing narrating, and that, that that line, you know, I would never imagine myself as an immigrant, even in this ghost world. Oh my God, like I was just like, tears just like pouring out. I was like, I was like, I was like recording through my tears. Mm. And you know, that was also, um, and I think there is like a sad truth in that line that makes me really, really sad because the, the cyclical history or reality that we live through, you know, and people often say, oh, this, these years, oh, this, this rampant Asian hate or whatever. And I was like, well, it's always been here. They maybe now you just know this a little uh, uh, more pronounced um, in on a public sphere, but it's not true. You know, it's not true that it's only recent. It's 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 1870. There was a, a Chinatown ma massacre in, in in LA and all that, right? So when you as a creator, you, you write works wanting to, you know, poking at topics and things and then seeing the reality that it's true again and again there is this in it a sadness uh to it but i also think that as an artist it is our it is my um power i guess uh to make this voice a little louder well said you yeah. you have made a piece that has existed long enough and in enough iterations to demonstrate how history is repeating itself, but you get to draw attention to it in this very special way, in an artistic expression that empowers people to think about their relationship and act on their relationship to this cyclical historical oppression um, and exclusion that is happening in immigration policy, for example, but also in uh, uh, um, prejudice and bias that happen that manifests violently in society. Um, and that it that it happens in a different way every 15 years that we do this piece, every five years that yes. it doesn't mean that it's not constant, like you said, it's constant. Yeah. And with with the especially with the the piece like a cockroach a cockroach's tentala, you know, we would also talk about like if I don't do it, you know, it'd be so interesting to see someone else do it and see what that might look like. Um, this gender, this who is the gender, like it's it's going to be like mind blowing, you know, so that's also something so interesting. Yeah. And just to bring the audience that's listening into this, A Cockroach's Tarantella, which occupies the first half of the program, is for a string quartet amplified, but with Du Yun narrating and enacting a very special um, staging that Rosha and Duyun designed. Um, and have you ever seen any other narrators do the piece? Has it ever happened? Never. Da, 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 da. <laughs> Exclusive. You have to come. If you're listening to this before the production, you have to come because this is the only time you're going to see it. So it's very exciting. Um, thank you, Duyun. I think we're at the end of our time. Um, and also thank you not only for this conversation, but uh, for the last 22 years of this collaborative existence that is the International Contemporary Ensemble and your work. Um, I know there'll be many, many more pieces down the road, but this is a very special one to bring back to New York City. Um, Thank you. And yeah. I just wanted to shout out um, to this production this time that uh, if you guys can come, please do, because uh, Satomi is incredible and and she she's like I've never done opera in that way and the stage thing and she's learning everything so fast and things and it's been so great to 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 perform with her and play around um this kind of elements with her yeah. so and maybe that's the way to wrap up our conversation is to really 
do the thing that is so important in collaboration, which is to name the people who are essential to it and what they're doing. And I'll start and you can add people as, as I, if I leave anyone off, but, but uh, Rosha and Du Yun came up with a design in Switzerland that's being sort of transcribed and scaled to the space at NYU Skirbel. Joining us is Satomi from the band Deerhoof. And this is an amazing uh, collaboration, even just that with the leaders of this project. Um, but some longtime collaborators are also involved. Nick Hofbeck, the lighting designer for the International Contemporary Ensemble, is joining this project. Um, and and uh, on the stage, percussionists like Nathan Davis, who joined the group in 2005, and people like um, Ryan Muncy, who is the saxophonist for the group since the beginning of of the saxophone <laughs> sound of the ensemble, you know. And, and our violinist Josh Motley, actually, Ross, he premiered uh, a cockroach tarantella. He said that, it, yes. and, and with with Eric Carlson, a yes. violinist who used to yes. play with the group. Yeah. But joining us on stage, in addition to Josh, the rest of the string quartet with Pauline Kim Harris and Hannah Levinson and Marielle Roberts, it's a really stunning group, and all led by a new collaborative, just like with Rosha, just like with Satomi a new conductor collaborator named Kamna Gupta, who's fantastic and we've been working with her throughout the week. Um, like most collaborations with the ensemble, there's long standing ones, decades long and brand new voices. And yeah. this is no exception. Yeah. Um, and I met Kamna through my last um, op opera and I just I just thought it was really great for us to introduce to her. And, um, and last but not uh, least, uh, Eddie Kwong, who will- yeah be on stage. Absolutely. Yeah, Eddie is joining as a, a character in movement and costume um, and creating costumes, uh, Zilvanus Yonusas. And so there's, it's just a village as usual. A large group comes together to create a project like this. And a Ross um, Parr who is calling three cues, if not five. Something like that. But in, in the end, the um, the group really understands what we're doing and why we're doing it, which has been a theme of this conversation and perhaps the most integral part of, of what we do is real passion and dedication to, to why. Um, thank you, Du Yun. And I thank think you. that wraps up our conversation. Okay. Thank you. Bye.